Thanks very much. I've been asked to uh, chair the discussion. Uh, we have all the speakers at the front, and I think we're running rather late, and the session is timed to end at five, and I propose, unless there's any objection, to try to stick to ending at five. And I want to make a suggestion, which is that we will take the questions in groups of three, because I think rather than having one question, one answer, I think that allows the speakers a little bit more reaction time to understand the question and to try to jump in more. So um, first of all, that means that we can't have the session at all until we have three people standing up. So you know, um, <laughs> we can do that. And just while the first three people are standing up, I'd just like to make one comment which I'd like to put out based on my understanding of what I've heard today. So what we've heard is primarily an executive approach to consciousness. It's been concerned with things like decision, integration, accumulation, and really executive functions. And for me, that's quite an interesting development because until perhaps 15, 20 years ago, all the dominant modes of thinking that one had about consciousness were very much about sensory phenomenology. One read a lot about qualia and uh, visual awareness in particular. So this seems to me like a radical change. And one uh, thing to put out, which perhaps will come up during the discussion, is is there any sensory phenomenology at all if consciousness is really constructed in the way we've heard about today? So that's just one question that I would like to answer, but I want to hear uh, the first three, please. So if we can start with you, please. Uh, I'll wait until Paul comes back, because it's partially for him, if that's OK. okay. Is, is he coming back? Um, here he is. Sorry, who were you looking for? for Paul. <laughs> okay, well, I can start. Um, this question is principally for Dr. Merker, but uh, Paul and Dr. Shadlin may have something to say about it as well. Um, I'm wondering how, if you attribute um, the summing up of all uh, estimates regarding sensory ambiguity and uh, preparing those for some kind of decision making by consciousness to subcortical structures, um, how do you reconcile? Um, the early sensory transients that often have to pass through the brainstem structures on their way up to the cortex, uh, if you know, all the activity that's going on down there is associated with finishing, sort of finalizing the sensory picture first. Right? And um, additionally, to Dr. Shadlin and uh, Paul as well, uh, I'm just wondering, um, regarding the different uh, parts of the brain that uh, represent the meeting point of both bottom-up and top-down influences or selection and, uh, sorry, specification and selection. Um, are there any general rules that apply to how those two uh, forces meet? Like, is it just a matter of input patterns or is there some sort of timeshare going on with different oscillations of input signals? Okay, so, thank you very much yeah. for that. So I hope you can keep that in working memory. Let's have the next question, please. Is still working? Yeah. I have a rather a question to Paul Chizek. Uh, I think like you emphasize quite a bit like the forward models, but also like the assignment of value, so that you kind of expect what kind of value a certain action will have. And I was wondering how all that emerges like in the initial phase when you start to learn, when you don't know the value of something, don't know the value of an action, and also don't know, so to say, what the feed-forward model should actually look like. Okay, thank you very much. And the third question. Uh, I'm Pauline, University of Montreal. Uh, this is a question for the whole panel. Uh, so today, today we talked about uh, cognitive abilities, but what about cognitive abilities and consciousness in terms of evolution? Because we all agree that uh, human con uh, cognitive abilities and especially human cognitive abilities are highly ad adaptive. But do you think that um, human brain with all its higher cognitive abilities could have evolved without consciousness, and do you think that human cognitive abilities absolutely need consciousness to fulfill their, their adaptive um, functions? Okay, thanks very much. So three um, questions there. Does anybody want to start off? I, I appreciated your question about the evolutionary and adaptive role of consciousness, because you've asked it several times, and it's sunk in to me that none of us are really answering it to your satisfaction. So I don't know if any of the people here would like to comment. I mean, Roy, you came quite close to that, I think, in, by highlighting the social and uh, 
information transmission between individuals functional consciousness. Perhaps we should move on to, there was a question about the learning phase in, in decisional models, and that, would anybody like to take that? Lots of people would like to take it, so uh, Bjorn and then Paul. Really, I'm not even sure that we have even started to answer this first question, because it was my impression that you were asking, could all this have been evolved, all these capacities, without consciousness? Is that your question? Is this kind of a zombie question? Could we be doing all the things we are doing anyway? Okay, that's a zombie question, okay? Now, that question assumes, that question, assu that's, that question is the epitome of the additive approach that I tried to outline this morning as inadequate. Uh, first of all, it assumes from the outset that consciousness has no function. Because if you could have us with the same capacities, but no consciousness, consciousness can't have any function. If you can add it and take it away and it makes no difference, Consciousness, by definition, doesn't have any function. And that, to me, seems to be uh, the wrong foot to get off on. Uh, you know, to assume from the beginning that it has no function, to me, is a peculiar thing. Uh, I would reverse the question and say, the, re the fact that, we, that, that at least we are conscious shows that somehow it must have some, con some function or, it wouldn't, or we wouldn't be conscious, okay? Uh, because I come from a basically biological background and uh, would assume that the old, you know, what is it uh, in Latin, uh, natura nihil frustra something, nature does nothing in vain, uh, okay? So why equip us with consciousness if it doesn't have a function? Well, entertaining us might be a, a possibility, but uh, I, th I don't think biology and mother nature is into entertaining us. So, uh, so uh, anyway. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> except, except they, sh they should pass the Turing test. They should be perfect per conversationalists. In other words, the zombie thing says they are exactly like us, but yeah. we can't tell that they don't have consciousness. That's the zombie argument. Okay. So now, thank you. Uh, well, just, I would address the question that was uh, made by, uh, about um, learning. How do we learn? Um, and I think uh, um, here I would essentially suggest uh, what, what Piaget suggested and what Thorndike suggested. You, you, do, you do it by trial and error. You, in other words, you, you, you do a movement and then you see what happens. Um, so this is how a baby learns how to control its arms. Just send some commands down to the, uh, to the muscles and, and watch how things move. And, and after a while, because his commands have uh, effect on certain parts of the world but not other parts of the world, he can learn, he or she can learn um, how to produce those kinds of uh, effects later. Um, and I think that uh, that applies to moving your body as well as interacting with the world. 
Um, and so I think what happens is when we train these monkeys, uh, they, they're moving a, a cursor on a screen with something like a joystick in many of these kinds of experiments. Uh, it's pretty weird for them to, eat, to care about a cursor on a screen. Um, but through trial and error, they learn how to, how to do that. And uh, Piaget called these uh, circular reactions or perception action cycles. And I think that's actually an extremely powerful way of a system to learn how to uh, control perception, control sensation. There's a follow-up. Yes, please. Uh, you mean because this achieves the goal that I had in mind? Yeah, but perhaps. Yeah, perhaps it confirms. And uh, any time, of course, things are not like that, you either modify your forward model or you decide that something has changed in the world. Um, so I, I think that's a, certainly a powerful way of uh, responding to that. Paul, a, a radical um, consequence of your view would be that we should feel a sense of agency over every single sensory input if it's all driven by uh, action perception cycles, and I don't think we do. Well, I don't have a good answer for why we uh, feel things about one thing or another. Um, this is, you know, this is not what 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 my um, my view is really addressing. It's it's more of a a more basic contextual thing of how the behavior is, is, is organized. So why are we conscious of certain kinds of motor sensory contingencies and not others? That I think some of the other speakers uh, have more to say about. Why should there be some, something um, particularly um, salient to us? And, and you know, one classic uh, suggestion is the things that are, are new, that we're learning, that we're attending to, uh, we're conscious of, but after a while, you know, like learning how to drive a car, after a while you're not conscious of using the clutch. You're conscious about uh, speeding up or slowing down or turning, etc. So, so maybe that's something like uh, things becoming au automatic um, uh, versus not automatic, and and why you want to have one thing, which is sort of the center spotlight, um, if when you're when you're learning something new or or you're dealing with um, the most valuable information. But again, maybe somebody else can say say about that. Would anybody else like to comment on learning? I would say one thing, if you don't mind, real quick. Just as a mathematical point for those of you that are interested, is that by accident, having a cortex that allows us to sample in the in form of a difference, like right minus left, as I was saying, um, implies that um, there's effectively um, a landscape of of information that lets us be rational. Because if you accumulate information in the form of differences, that is then things begin to look like diffusion, and the variables you in, in accumulate have regularities that look like degrees of belief, log likelihood ratios. And what that implies is that you don't really have to learn by associating every state of your brain with the outcome and success and so forth. You can actually extrapolate. And um, we have ample evidence for that in the lab. Um, and I think that's, that's something kind of interesting to think about, that how accidentally we, be, we became rational simply because we had the capacity to sample differences from, say, sensory cortex, which is an accident of the way our cortex is laid out, and say, maybe not the way a rodent's is with a salt and pepper arrangement of information. That, that seems quite profound, because I mean, certainly in psychology, we often think about associations between contents as being part of the fundamental way the cortex works. And you're saying that actually the ability to make to take differences and to consider ordinal relations between contents, something having, for example, more evidence in favor of it than something else. Is that more important? Yeah, I'm, I'm suggesting that there are certain regularities that we can take advantage of. So we, ultimately, we do have to form associations, just as Paul was saying. But I don't think we have to, you know, if you take that to, the, to its sort of absurd extreme, that we have to do everything possible thing in order to learn what the possible outcome will be of some minor variation on, on, on a theme. Um, I want to say one other thing that in relation to what Roy said, if you don't mind. Um, um, no, I'll just I'll hold off. Sorry. Um, there was a question about finalizing subcortical estimates, and I can't remember who asked it, but I wondered whether this was about uh, corticothalamic recurrent connections or something. But it seemed interesting. So, oh yes, that's right. I, was, was it a corticothalamic question? I can do this more succinctly. So, Paul's outline of the brain that he gave us was that. Different parts of it bifurcate into specification and selection systems, and they do that principally at the level of cortex, right? For Bjorn, 
your idea of consciousness is that there is a central decision mechanism implemented in the uh, below the cortex, and its role is to uh, help select actions once it's finalized all sensory information. So, but the problem with that is that the brainstem is not only an, uh, the final output funnel, but it's also the principal input structure. And you see transient sensory responses at the beginning. So I'm wondering how you reconcile what would be the role of early sensory processing in these brainstem structures. The brainstem, of course, is the conduit for both the upgoing and the downgoing information. And essentially, the uh, bot bottom-up uh, 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 cortex I, I view as, as this huge machine for probabilistic inference to, to settle all the ambiguities and so on. Now, that is, that is getting fed to you, you need a base for those probabilistic uh, 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 operations. And I think the primary sensory areas, which are all, all the, the, they are always the huge, biggest areas in cortex. They are, the, they are the staging posts. They are the staging areas for this probabilistic process. And then comes the estimate thing, and part of that estimate may be in motor cortex. But the other part of it is that huge part of cortical, uh, of, of, of uh, cortical thalamic circuitry, which, which ends up not in the, in the relay thalamus, lateral geniculate, medial geniculate, and ventral basal complex, which is the path up to cortex, but there is the pyramidal layer, uh, 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 layer five pyramidal cell output, this massive output from all of cortex down to the uh, mediodorsal nucleus and pulvinar, which has a very, very different function. This, I call this the other thalamus in one of the papers, in one of the chapters I put up on the, on the screen. This is the other thalamus. The other thalamus is a major hub of, of, of interaction between cortical areas. And some of it may be this enabling thing, for how do cortical areas talk to one another? Well, part of what they need is enabling information from the, from the other thalamus, that is, uh, uh, mediodorsal and uh, pulvinar, uh, and a few others. So, uh, so there's no conflict between, we, between the upgoing and, and downgoing. This is a special purpose thing, and uh, uh, the, because I'm interested in sensory consciousness primarily, I've concentrated on the pulvinar part of it, which is vastly interconnected with all of sensory cortex, all the three major modalities, and uh, projects back to them with high security synapses. So, so I, 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 there's no conflict in the, in the down and up. A good question. Any other comment on that? Just a quick comment that I think um, uh, in the, I, I focused on cerebral cortex because uh, I have short electrodes uh, mostly, and so, so that's where I study them. Uh, but we are planning to go down deeper, uh, and I do think actually the systems there's no there's no need to focus on the cortex. Um, I think one reason it's useful to focus on the cortex in these kinds of simple behavioral things because um, cortex is some, sometimes a little bit too exalted for higher cognition only. And I think it's actually involved in these it's fairly mundane sensory motor tasks, and that's its primary role. But the thing is, I do actually think that you you can um, it's it's extremely likely I think that there are multiple um, uh, multiple places where the competition goes on at the same time. And uh, the basal ganglia are one uh, site where actually the competition may be going on there as well. Uh, the superior colliculus may be a site. All these regions could be leaning one way or the other. And they may be doing it at different times. So when you're, when you're biasing your decision, let's say on, on very simplistic, um, obvious, prepotent information, uh, the early responses may shift in that direction, but later when other regions like prefrontal cortex uh, um, get online, get do their thing and, uh, and start biasing, you might switch. And, and that switch may be happening everywhere at once. It, there may be, in fact, a context-dependent order in which you see decisions emerge, and there is some evidence for that. So when decisions are bottom-up, they may be parietal before frontal. When they're top-down, they may be prefrontal first and then later uh, superior curriculum or something like that. And so these things uh, could be actually happening everywhere. And, and, and what determines decision really is commitment uh, in the sense of moving. Um, at least, you know, I'm on the mo motor end. So we don't really need to commit to anything until we move. Uh, and, and moving really is committing because now your opponents can see what you're going to do. Your prey might run away. You might um, reveal yourself. Uh, and so you actually want to resist committing uh, at least to actions as long as possible in the natural world. Um, so I, I think it, I, I think it's, it's more or less, okay, everywhere at once. Okay, how's that?
Thanks very much. I think we should move on to the next three questions, please. So there was one there. So you first, please. Okay, this is Carrie Hoff from McGill. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Shadlin um, about the uh, apparent, like impression that I get from your data is that the more the monkey is sure of its a choice, like the, the firing rate of the neurons seem to increase, right? So that's, I don't know, maybe that's just looking at the single cell level, what, what the single cells are doing, but could you um, extrapolate that into like the, at the population level with all um, cells in that area start firing um, high at a higher rate if the monkey is more sure of its decision and if so um, how does that relate to if you were to do like an fMRI on the monkey um, doing similar types of tasks would you see activation um, when the monkey is uh, more certain okay. because okay. this is kind of interesting in terms of sorry um, Quickly, please. yeah uh, it seems a uh, little bit incongruous with what we were left to think from um, the last day's talks that it's when things are in conflict that you have activation of the brain area. Okay, thank you very much. Next question, please. Hi, uh, Anna from University of British Columbia. My question goes to Paul Cizek. Um, first of all, thank you for your talk and thank you for bringing this idea about the control system, the control theory to looking at behavior as a dynamic systems, which is something also that we got from Damasio when he gave us his idea of homeostasis. And um, as a psychologist, I've been trained to look into uh, manipulation and measuring the response, stimulus response. So I come from this previous framework, and now I am trying to devise experiments that will allow me to break through this way of thinking of stimulus response. And I find myself that it's quite challenging. So because there, it's difficult to control things that were, we measure stimuli response because it's easier to control. <laughs> So I was wondering if you have some strategies or maybe some literature recommendations that would help me try to break through the framework of the past. Okay, we'll bank, <laughs> we'll, uh, bank that one. And the next, last question, please. Uh, yeah, this is Burton Boris from Athabasca University. And this is primarily for Paul Sizek, but also uh, in general. Uh, there's the comments about uh, populations of neurons being in competition and the ones that went out in the competition uh, going to the actual action that ends up being performed or the motor action. Uh, I'm wondering if we're looking at this in terms of a dynamical system, whether uh, this idea of competing populations of neurons is the best way to look at it or whether I might want to think instead of the overall dynamical system enhancing certain fluctuations that are automatically occurring in the neural populations. Uh, and I haven't done a lot of work in modeling neurons or anything like that, but looking at uh, ecological models, it's the same question as to whether species compete to fill a niche or the niche attracts the species that can fill it. Okay, thank you very much. So we've got three questions there. Let's hope we can have short answers so we can have some more questions later. Does anybody want to pick up on any of those? Mike? Yeah. So, so I'll say a little tiny thing about each one. The first one was about um, increases in firing rate associated with um, certainty. And um, one of the points is that it's not just the firing rate in association with certainty, but the elapsed time. So the same amount of firing rate supports a different amount of certainty depending on the amount of time. The next part of that had to do with fMRI, and I don't know what fMRI is showing. I don't think it's actually uh, showing you anything about the spike rates. I think it's telling you something about this kind of tagging operation between areas, and that's why you see these whopping signals uh, that don't correlate with firing rates in areas, but it's not about, like, the neural correlate of something. So, um, and I wouldn't be surprised if that goes with the LFPs as well. They're telling us something really important, but it's not the firing rates of neurons. Um, and then um, the, um, but that's speculation, right? Nobody really knows. Um, the, the, there were two questions about dynamical systems and populations in competition. To explain um, certainty, um, we can't just simply take 
um, uh, high firing rates. We have to think about the um, the loser of the race. So it's not there is information in the in the um, in the in the neurons that didn't achieve the highest firing rates, and we need that to explain confidence judgments in humans. It's not just enough to know the firing rates of the winners. We think we we obviously aren't recording the neurons in the, in the humans, but we can infer their state based on the psychophysics. It's not enough to just to know that even when you couple it with the lapse time, but you need to know other other populations in the brain, we think, too, including the losers. Uh, dynamical systems, I just say to the students, beware of these sirens. Um, the, um, these are, you know, when there is a mystery about, about things in the brain, that people do magic. They wiggle things at 40 hertz. They decide synchronous spikes are the ones that matter, um, whatever. But um, dynamical systems is just the new version of that. So just, um, I mean, you know, obviously, the brain is a, is a dynamical system. But the idea that you don't have to code variables for computation and simply that you're just looking at a dynamical system system and evolution is, um, well, I'll just leave off my adjective for it, but I would, I would avoid it. Okay. Good. Um. So uh, I'd like to answer first the question that was asked over here um, about how to do experiments about uh, in interaction in the wild. And, and I've asked myself the same question because uh, I'm kind of, uh, I'm kind of uh, <clears throat> not living up to my own, my own preaching. Uh, I should be out in the, in the wild. Uh, but of course, those experiments are very hard to control. Um, but I think, in, in a sense, uh, on one hand, um, we don't have to actually uh, do experiments that are not controlled. We can we can do experiments in the lab, and and do them in a very controlled fashion, as long as we don't uh, mistake our experimental method for a theory. Um, so, for example, one of one of the studies I think is 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 most exciting was most exciting to me in the last few years is that Ledberg study that I showed about the timing of signals in the cortex. I think it's a beautiful study, and this is a study that I think says a lot about normal natural behavior in the wild. But this was a dark room with a monkey with the head fixed, looking at a single square and making an on and off response. And yet, you can still interpret it in the context of a theory that's informed by studies in ethology. So I think you can you can combine the, the studies. You can take inspiration from the ethologists, you can devise very highly controlled experiments. And some people are doing this very nicely. For example, Michael Platt is doing some beautiful studies in the lab, a very controlled ex uh, uh, environment that is about foraging behavior and the trade-offs that animals have to deal with in foraging behavior. So this is Platt and Hayden, for example, a, a set of beautiful studies. Um, Mike Doris is doing some really nice studies on, on ocular foraging tasks. Um, a lot of these experiments are actually um, uh, trying to get at, at the more embodied behavior, despite the fact of not being embodied. So I think you can deal with the technical, um, technical reasons. Then again, on the other hand, some people are also doing studies where they actually implant animals with wireless electrode arrays uh, and uh, observing them in real time and then doing complicated mathematics to try to correlate neural activity. That's quite challenging, but I think it can be done, ultimately. Uh, I'd, like also if, I'd also like to address the question about uh, dynamical systems. Uh, and I think uh, it's absolutely right. I mean, um, we're talking about single cells firing, but I think um, in reality, uh, uh, the proper description, mathematical description of the systems is, is um, in terms of, in terms of the dynamical systems. So again, things like what did the other cells do uh, is important. Um, and I think uh, in the in, in sense of competition, I think actually the dynamical systems approach is, is the one that, at least to my mind, has been the most um, the most valuable description, the, the kinds of models we can make uh, with, you know, uh, attractor, uh, basins of attraction, et cetera, uh, actually really capture the neural activity very well um, when you uh, look at single cells and try to extrapolate what all the cells are doing together. So I, I agree that that's actually a, a better description um, when it's properly uh, uh, defined and when you actually define what your, what your variables mean. Any other comment on those? Okay, so um, we have two people on their feet. So we don't have three questions, but I think that will make a nice uh, last two, or maybe we have a third. So would you like to ask your question, please? Um, I think uh, this is for Michael Shedlin. <clears throat> he did mention that there was absolutely no need for nonsense. Well, I'm kind of going to introduce a bit of nonsense. Um, but first of all, he said. Uh, that he was measuring confidence. Now, what I can't understand is how you can measure confidence without ha the animal having some idea of belief. If he's got some idea of belief, then he's in the nonsense category, is he not? Okay, thank you. Um, please. 
Uh, Malcolm McIver from Northwestern University. I have a quick methodological question for Shadlin and then a question uh, for the rest of the panel. Um, question for Shadlin is I, I really like this model of bootstrapping essentially uh, embodiment derived processes, processes to do with sensing and, and acting uh, toward more abstract things. Um, but I, I have a methodological question in that people who study decision making say in humans can do things like ask humans to say look at the the clock when they make that decision. How do you go about experimenting on animals when you're making decisions about decisions about decisions? And I'm wondering if you have any ideas about that. For the broader panel, I have a question about um, uh, animals at very different levels of, of um, development show decision making over not just sensory inflow, but about things like internal maps, such as spatial maps of so bees. Uh, look at a waggle dance of another bee and they go off to a foraging area and, and, and fish will make decisions uh, to go to a particular patch of their environment based on an internal map. So that's very different from making decisions about sensory inflow because, for example, as you uh, make that decision, whereas when you're making it about something you see, like a zebra, the entire scene is changing dynamically. When you make a decision about a spatial map, things aren't changing. So that might require a different process. So that's, I wonder what you guys think about whether there's differences there. Okay, thank you very much. And the last question, please. Um, thank you, Xavier Derry, University of Montreal. Um, it's a question I've been really trying to ask um, Google and, and colleagues, uh, but somehow I couldn't find the right words, but you might be the right people to ask that question. Um, it's, my question is about uh, single cell uh, single neuron studies measurements and you know, the way I, under I understand it with the uh, neuroanatomy of the, the specific organism that's being studied uh, we have a general idea a pretty specific idea where to poke uh, one uh, electrode and then there's some kind of fine-tuning to where this for instance where this electrode is actually situated in the in the field of vision or something like that um, but then it's about the 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 repeatability of such experiments, because you, I suppose you can't uh, leave the electrodes in place forever, um, infections and such, and when the monkeys return to the cage or, or something like that. So if, if you're, all this information, this really fantastic information that's been uh, collected by these studies, to what measure is it uh, repro uh, reproductible? Because next time you poke the, electrode in that specific area, you're going to miss by, you know, 10,000 neurons, the specific one you had the study before. So Okay, thanks very like much. That. So Heraclitus said that you can't step into the same river twice, and I think your question is, can you step into the same neuron twice? Um, no, I know you can. Right. So, okay, so I'd like to hear what the panel have to say about those questions. Uh, okay, the first question was about the nonsense, and um, you are I'm absolutely right. You, you, what you said just now is not nonsense at all to me, um, and um, what I said probably was a bit nonsensical in using the word confidence too loosely, because confidence does, and I think that's what you're basically accusing me of, and I, I agree with you. Um, I mean, I'm measuring certainty, and I'm only measuring it through a proxy of post-decision wagering. Um, confidence, you know, in a way carries some kind of a subjective connotation anyway, and of course we can't ask the monkey that just like we can't ask him what he sees when he sees the random dot motion. So the, the leap of faith is that we also see things like the monkey, we have the same regularities as the monkey and the psychophysics, and we assume that those processes in the brain that we study in the monkey, uh, when we can't ask the monkey what it feels like to see, are also partly responsible for what it's like for us when we answer the similar questions. But you know, beyond that we can't go, and the same thing holds for confidence. So, um, um, but I will say that humans and monkeys behave the same way on those tasks in terms of their confidence reports. They both, you know, the same, all the reg same regularities down to the mathematics hold. Um, the embodiment of the abstract question too, um, you know, you're right that there's our, there are technical challenges and the kinds of experiments that we do with the monkeys. I mean, we're constantly trying to push the envelope. We have monkeys going, taking decisions to go to the library. Actually, we don't. We're working on it now. In other words, saying, I need more information. I want to go explore, not in order to answer a new question, but to, because I think the other part of this landscape, in this case, a landscape of knowledge, uh, might help me make another decision. So it, it's beginning to sound a lot more structured. Um, but it, again, these are highly trained monkeys that become expert in that particular environment, so that's a limitation. 
And um, if, this was, if had I had time to give you a longer talk, I'd tell you how we knit together from rodent through man all these different, uh, human I should say, um, all these different kinds of, um, of, um, of levels and what each model has to offer. I would like to say one last thing, one thing about this, uh, the technical question about the simple cell, about um, single cells and repeatability. Uh, it is a tricky business um, in the cortex uh, an interesting fact about the cortex that makes it different from subcortical structures is that for the most part, neurons are clustered. Um, there's a lot of, um, of, of redundancy among neurons. Uh, you don't have time for a long lecture, and these guys would kill me if I gave you one, but the thing that's special about the cortex is that it computes in the interspike interval of any one input, so it computes in something like a high input regime. So and this is what makes single unit physiology possible, and why you find that any neuron near your electrode seems to have something to do with the task. It's bizarre. Why should it be? But there's natural reasons why, and I've read, written several papers on why neurons are noisy, why, um, you know, why, what's the fundamental limits of signal to noise, why we don't see the lights flickering and things like that. And it all comes down to that special property of cortex computing in a high input regime. I actually have an answer to the quality question, but I'll save that. Um, any other comments on belief? Ezekiel. Oh, I just wanted to um, add one thing uh, regarding uh, magic. And um, so basically, What's fascinating is, and, and I agree with Merker and Shadlin, that at some point one has to explain as a scientist why I'm not aware of the peristalsis going on right now, digesting the smoked sandwich I had during lunch, and I'm aware of this. And that's just an empirical question that we have to answer. And so Merker's coming at it from a very uh, naturalist disposition, trying to explain how the dolphin echolocates or how the human being is conscious. Um, and at this stage of understanding, a lot of people say, well, you know, uh, uh, consciousness has no function or it's epiphenomenal, but, you know, we don't know what it is. We don't know. We know what the steam whistle is, whether it does anything for the train. And as scientists, we have to explain it even if it has no function because we have to explain how it falls within the natural world. So there's unfortunately no escape from the hard problem. And I've heard many different accounts of trying to escape the hard problem by saying, that the whole universe is conscious, or that it's a basic dimension of reality. And then you start asking questions about this, and you say, well, uh, this, this bottle is also conscious? Yes, because it's a part of reality, but less than you. Why? Because the organization of it is different. Oh, what's different? Guess what? You're back at the hard problem. So there's no, there's no escape to this beautiful problem. It seems to me that we've come usefully full circle, and my watch says that it's now 5 o'clock. So I'd like to thank all the speakers and you for your patience. Thank you.